So, uh, very much welcome to the official Social Media Week London Hub, uh, sponsored by Google+. Plus. We're delighted this morning to have a really interesting panel on the future of sharing that's been put together by our friends at Beyond, and it's got a fantastic panel. Um, a couple of housekeeping bits and pieces. So, first up, there is Wi-Fi in here. Uh, if it goes down, we'll get a man to turn it off and then turn it on again in a highly technical manner. Um, the password is forum2011, all in lowercase. The hashtag is hash SMW sharing. If you have big sausage fingers like me and a small phone, then SMWLDN is a perfectly fine hashtag to use as well if you are tweeting up a storm. So enjoy. Um, there is one note about the heat in here. It will either be boiling hot or freezing cold. It's part of the challenge of the event and it will keep you awake. So it's really good. Uh, I will hand over to Nick from Beyond to kick off the session. Enjoy. Thanks, Sam. Uh, I'm Nick Rappelt. I'm the Managing Director of Beyond in the UK. Uh, thank you all for coming. Nice to see so many people here. We've got the two seats at the front. I don't know if anyone's brave enough at the back who wants to have a seat. Um, the event today is all around the future of sharing and we've got a fantastic panel as Sam said and we're going to be doing a kind of panel discussion. The reason we're delayed is we're waiting for our, our moderator, he's a guy called Gordon McMillan. Uh, he's the social media editor of Haymarket but he actually went to the design centre instead of the design council which is in Islington so he called me up in a, in a bit of a panic but he should be here in five minutes so if you can give him a bit of a cheer when he comes in I'm sure he'll appreciate it. Um, so, if I just really introduce you briefly to the panel, uh, then there's a run of, of the event on your chair, uh, but Ash from Nokia is going to present a case study of how Nokia have used social media and sharing to fight the smartphone battle. If I just first introduce you to the panel, and then Ash will do a presentation, I'm going to share some results of our survey um, that was published on Mashable uh, yesterday, so you can have a look at it there if, if you fancy. Uh, first of all, Ash Chowdhury, who's the head of digital at Nokia. Morning, everybody. Um, pleasure to be here. Um, so, yeah, I head up uh, actually what's now called consumer engagement for uh, Nokia UK, Ireland, and now France. Um, I'll, I'll be speaking a bit more later, so I'm going to hand over very quickly. Hi, I'm Trevor Johnson. Um, I've had a various roles over the last four years of, of being at Facebook, but uh, currently doing the role where we're, uh, on a global level, uh, increasing the relationship we have with our media and creative partners. So I work with that global team. Hello, uh, I'm Alistair Frost, and I work for Microsoft, where I'm the head of digital marketing strategy uh, for our marketers in the UK, which essentially means helping Microsoft marketers do their jobs better using emerging digital channels. Good morning, I'm Mark Jones, I'm from Reuters. I'm the global communities editor, and I spend most of my time building communities behind the paywall. Thanks, guys. Uh, Gordon's here. Say hello to everyone, Gordon. <laughs> I, I did let it slip, Gordon, that you went to the design centre, yeah, which is... Uh, thank you for moderating our session. Um, I'll pass you over to Ash now, who's going to give a bit of an intro into Nokia and how they've used social media. Hello. Okay, really good to see so many people here. Um, interested to hear what, not just I, what I have to say, but my esteemed um, members of the panel. So I'm going to uh, kick off and basically share with you, a, um, for a few minutes, a social project that's quite significant for Nokia right now, um, and it's called The Amazing Collective. So to set the scene, um, this is the turning point for Nokia uh, with the launch of the new Lumia 800 smartphone. I don't know if you've seen this or you've seen the advertising. Um, uh, the smartphone market is a very crowded place, and... Um, um, there's significant competition in this environment. So the device that I've just shown has had an amazing response. And um, given that it also comes with, uh, it, it's, it's using the Microsoft Windows Phone OS, um, the response we've had has been significant. We've had very high customer satisfaction ratings on this. Um, but the issue is, is that needs to be propelled out there and um, 
we need to amplify this information and, and, and this positive sentiment uh, to a wider audience. We can't just say how great this phone is. Uh, ultimately, we need to put it in the hands of other people and effectively get them to experience it and prove that this is quite an excellent product. Because ultimately, phones sell phones. But in order to do that, we need to find a way to reach the types of people who, through positive experience um, of the device, would spread the word um, through, throughout their networks on how great the, um, the product is. So how would we go about doing that? So we're using social technology, ultimately, to support this program. Um, but we want to talk to everyday consumers, not just um, influencers. Um, and for that, there was a lot of groundbreaking uh, work that was done um, using the social agencies uh, that support Nokia, Wonderman, and Blast Radius. And um, the work that we did enabled us to, to identify and target um, a selection of everyday uh, consumers. And we used Facebook advertising um, and messaging, email, uh, traffic from our own media, um, to, to target and promote uh, um, this program that we were working on. But everything that we did, bear in mind that we did it always uh, on a permission basis, and uh, the targeting that we did was via publicly available uh, data. Just thought I'd put that point in. So um, recruiting people into the Amazing Collective um, was done in a very cryptic way for some. Um, uh, in an unbranded, um, curious call to action. Uh, but it was basically appealing, not, not from a Nokia perspective, but uh, from a challenge uh, where we're, we're seeking adventure seekers, uh, people who were looking beyond the ordinary to take part in, effectively, a special program. And um, we drove applicants who saw, took interest into this through, the Facebook, uh, through a Facebook app that was designed to filter against um, certain types of criteria and um, we combined this with an online um, screening challenge uh, in order to identify and define the ultimate team uh, for our advocacy program, which is the Amazing Collective. But how do you recruit from a mass um, to a collective few? Well, well, we believe that having got the right people, um, the few will amplify to the mass. Um, and we also wanted to ensure that we had a very good cross-section uh, of people and a good spread of demographic. So what we did, from the recruitment perspective, was to reach out to literally millions upon millions of, uh, of people via our advertising and messaging, um, which we then whittled down to tens of thousands uh, using the Facebook app and the human screening um, in order to get to a core cluster and a core group of people. Now, the program's focused on experience experiences uh, that are enhanced by the product. Um, and the benefit of the product is, uh, is told through the experience, not the other way around. Now, leveraging on uh, the native social behaviors in order to push those experiences of the phone to their peers, uh, it's about talking to friends and not necessarily talking amongst the, the existing community in order to support the mass effect. Um, but one thing to consider is, from Nokia's perspective, it's a very brave move to go in this direction where um, it's an adventure uh, for us. And um, there's an understanding and acceptance that there's a high potential that the investment we do in the advertising would have a low response rate. Um, but the mantra that we always had was, it, it's, qual it's quality before quantity for this type of program. So. Uh, Having successfully recruited the core members of this, uh, of this um, advocacy program, each member received one of these, um, um, a Lumia device. But each device had a very bespoke app called the Amazing Collective app, um, which became the communication tool through which suggestive missions and challenges were sent out to every collective member. Um, the challenges were set to create and share content via their phone. Um, and this content was published via, via a Facebook page and also on the individual social network, um, for which points were accumulated and exclusive rewards were given for the creativity of the content produced and also the engagement of their posts. 
Now, uh, in order to participate in this program, the barrier was very low. Um, and it was focused basically on everyday situations and interesting, um, that are interesting with an element of amazing. And in terms of what we asked people to do, nothing really complicated. Fun moments, essentially, captured through the phone. And ex experiencing the effortlessly sim uh, simple way of utilizing the device and the services was obviously a byproduct of that, uh, of that engagement. Gamifications of missions um, and leaderboards and badges, this proved really, um, really, really positive in, in the setup of this program. Um, and participants, regardless of there being an incentive or not, are chasing badges. It's really interesting, uh, basically, how the recruitment has uh, pulled together you know, people who are so passionate about supporting a project like this, you know, they don't need to be pushed. And the response has been absolutely amazing. Uh, with most of, the, most of the participants accessing the app to, to um, observe the missions that are being pushed and um, uh, follow the news feeds and updates for, for the community, um, people are, um, are now starting to speak through their own channels about uh, the product you know, without really asking them. Um, and some of these, these people, these power uh, advocates, uh, we're now inviting them back uh, to provide content that's going to a broader audience and potentially through to an ATL campaign. And what we've seen from our research is that mobile and social technology, this has allowed us to track the, the strength of advocacy uh, and the power of sharing. I mean, we've had over 2,000 uh, live demos that have been registered from the devices out there with the Amazing Collective. Um, and what's great about this project is that this journey has gone beyond the, the context of digital uh, and sharing content and conversations. The program's delivering a, a physical experience uh, through the device from which the business um, can see a real tangible uh, return and benefit um, on the social investment. So this is something that we plan to continue and grow um, with the advocate and the community that's part of this program. That's, that's it from me, but uh, this is, a, I think, from our point of view, how we perceive uh, the importance of social and particularly sharing uh, within our business model moving forward. Thanks. <laughs>
It's just that lady in the blue shirt at the end of that row. Um, thanks. So that kind of gives you a view of the, the current state of sharing, how many people are using social networks. Um, just to, this is UK and US. So the sample was 2,059 consumers, uh, UK, US. All had to be active Facebook, or Twitter, or Google Plus users. There's a high proportion of Facebook users, 98%, which shows the dominance of Facebook. Uh, and the age range was between 16 and 40, with 68% of people between 19 and 34. Um, so what we wanted to do is we wanted to look at some predictions, and we wanted to put these predictions up so that then the panel can talk about them, and you can ask questions to the panel about what they think is going to happen in the future. Interesting findings. Um, the rate of content being shared online, uh, we believe, will eventually plateau. And it's quite an interesting stat that uh, it's probably quite interesting for, for Trevor as well, because you might not have seen this, but uh, the rate of sharing by users on Facebook actually declines the longer you, you are on Facebook as a platform. Um, but the frequency of logins increases. So that's probably one of the challenges that brands need to look at, which is how you get people to share as much information over time. Um, frictionless sharing, which is the cause of, I guess, debate at the moment, some controversy, some people like it. Um, what we found was that frictionless sharing is here to stay, as in 67% of people um, have at least done one of the following. That's automatically shared something like listen to a song, uh, allowed an application to post automatically, or read automatically an article through something like the Guardian app, which is then shared on someone else's wall. But I guess the interesting fact that is that 61% of people are annoyed uh, with fl frictionless sharing. So we think it's there to stay, but probably needs to change in some way so people don't feel like they're being spammed. Um, and then segmenting friends was the next section. 62% um, said the idea appeals to them, which I guess follows hotly on Google Plus and the way that the network's set up. Um, only 40% of people have created subgroups. But with the rise of social networks and multiple platforms, we think that trend will continue where you, you have to segment or you will segment your friends into different buckets. Um, true marketing tactics remain the same. Uh, I think it's interesting for companies selling products that 60% of people said they'd be willing to post about a brand, product or a service on Facebook if they were offered a deal or a discount. So traditional marketing tactics, even though we're looking at social media and what's happening in the future still apply. And then lastly, which I personally think is one of the most interesting findings, is what will people share in the future? And I think this also gives rise, or gives insight to brands about the sorts of campaigns that be, can be created. Um, personal milestones were the top, so you achieving a personal milestone being shared. And interestingly, travel plans and ticket purchases uh, were the next two items followed by charitable donations. So um, good call out for charities to how they use um, social networks. So that was uh, a snapshot of the research that we conducted. The, the presentation will be available. We can, we can put it up on SlideShare and we can send out the questions that we asked if people are interested. Um, I'll now pass you over to Gordon, uh, because I'm sure most of you are here to uh, see and speak to the panel. So Gordon. Oh, thank you, Nick. Um, a really timely uh, point to be having a discussion on the future of sharing. I suppose most of you have seen this morning um, reports that Facebook is going to be launching uh, timelines for brands very shortly and is going to be possibly announcing plans in New York at the end of the month. So it'll be good if we, interesting to see if we can put some questions to Trevor and put him on the spot and see if he can uh, maybe shine a light on that. Not to feel too much pressure, though. Um, there. Okay. Okay. Friction is sharing. It's the thing we're talking about. It's what we're going to be seeing more of. We've seen a little bit of it rolled out with some of the apps we've seen on Facebook with The Guardian, The Washington Post, and Storify. With brands uh, coming along with their own timelines, we're going to see brands start to develop some social apps. So more of that friction is sharing. Possibly more people getting annoyed, maybe more people engaging with brands and brands doing more interesting things. So let's sort of move through the panel and see what the panel think. If we kind of work our way down from Ash onwards, and um, so friction is sharing. Are we going to be seeing more, more of it? Has Facebook made a mistake? What do you think the future is on that? Hello? Sorry, can you hear? Yes, you can hear me. Yeah. Um, 
I think there is definitely a place for uh, frictionless sharing moving forward. Um, but it, it all comes down to user choice. If we, um, or if the providers can establish um, an intuitive way that makes it very simple for consumers to really realize what they are sharing and, and, and configure the, the, the types of um, information um, available on them, then, then for sure there's, um, there's, a, there's a strong future. But we have to be very, very careful of um, you know, the pitfalls because some do it well, some, there are some examples where um, you know, uh, it, it causes embarrassment. Are there sort of examples that spring to mind? Um, well, Nike Plus, they, they do it very, very well in terms of you know, um, uh, how you, um, sharing technology on, on, on how your, your health and fitness um, uh, progresses. Uh, if you're performing in a marathon or uh, um, people are aware of that, they can send you a virtual cheer. That's great. There's a, there's a funny example um, that I, I heard about um, with a similar company called Fitbit. I don't know if you're aware of that, but it's a, a piece of technology that people um, wear and um, it's calibrated with a, a dashboard that, uh, that understands your, your movement and translates that into energy and, and action. Um, however, I think the way that it's set up, it automatically um, socializes your activity, if you like, um, and um, tweets on you know, whether or not you're out for a jog or something like that. But at the same time, the power of this uh, was misunderstood by somebody who, um, uh, I think it translated certain movements into certain performances. So it was saying, I think, without them knowing that they were having sex uh, quite frequently. Uh, so this is an example of where it just goes a little too far. Uh, Trevor. Uh, we don't refer to frictionless sharing. Uh, new social apps is, is the term that we use. Um, I mean, as, as Nick said, it's here to stay. The, the whole concept is, is when you've got an authentic person who you uh, can connect to and they can connect to their friends, what power does that unleash when you think about brands, organizations, and businesses? So you think about music, right? Uh, Spotify uh, has a very big integration of new social apps. If you go onto the, Spot the Spotify um, uh, application, it completely changes according to who you are, who your friends are, and what they're listening to. That's a very powerful thing, right? Particularly when you think of how, many, how much music is, is out there. The, the way you can filter that is through your friends. We think that's very, very powerful. Um, we think that there's, there's actually a, there's a, there's a problem when you increase more and more sharing in that there's more and more things that are going to be there to be served to you or there's more information. And what we are going to do as human beings is revert to our friends. What, what social apps allows you to do is to find the things that are relevant and engaging to, to you depending on, on the category you're in. So we've seen it for music in terms of Spotify and Pandora and radio. We're starting to see it with news. So if you go to the, the Guardian app, if you go to Yahoo News now and you press the blue button, which is the, the, the Facebook button, that interface completely changes according to who your friends are and what they've read. And we think that's much more powerful for you. So you, both, you see both what your friends have ra rated, reviewed, and read, and you see what the editor is, 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 is there to do. If you think about uh, shopping, so uh, there's, a, there's a site called Etsy, which is a very, uh, it's about handcraft, and it's, it's a quite a, I'm not going to say niche, but it's, it's a quite particular website um, that serves you edited uh, gifts and, and, and um, content that you might want to buy. But again, if you press that blue button, all of a sudden what you see is based on what your friends have, have got in their likes or interests. It's based on what they may, may have purchased before on, on Etsy and they've allowed Etsy to use that information. So all of a sudden you've got this website that is personal to you. And that's the power of, of, of sharing, right? It's not about getting a status update and saying I liked Coke. It's about having an authentic identity, a person you're connected to with their friends, understanding who they are, allowing them to use all that information to serve that individual, a very relevant, very engaging, a very social um, thing. And we've already seen what it's, what it's doing for things like Spotify, where they've increased the amount of people that uh, actually use it on a monthly basis significantly. They've inc significantly increased the, the amount of people that pay, pay for it as a, as a paid for subscription service. Increases the, the engagement you have on Facebook because you see all of this stuff in, in your newsfeed, in your ticker. And we're starting to see that having a really profound effect. And you can start to see how that's going to work with, say, TV, how that's going to work with e-commerce, how that's going to work with multiple things that currently exist online. So sharing, 
Brixton are sharing, social apps we think are a very important part of, of the social, uh, building that platform and allowing people to have really relevant enga engaging experiences with brands that they, that they love. Any insight on how that might change how we all interact with brands on Facebook? Um, so brands need, to, need to, to, to understand they need to be integrated into user experience and they need to create things that people want to engage with and may want to share with their friends. And that's either active share or, or share through usage of, of their products and services. So we need to think about creating things that people are going to care about and what people are going to share. And that's a very difficult thing as a brand and organisation, right? Because we're used to creating things that are about driving attention, disrupting what people are doing within those online spaces. We now need to be a seamless part of that because people are going to their news feeds and people are going to their ticker to find out what their friends are engaging with. If, your friends, if their friends aren't engaging with things that your brands are creating, then people aren't seeing those things. So we need to really step back and understand how we can build lightweight interactions over time that people want to share and people really, really care about. Um, right, so the question is, is frictionless sharing here to stay? I, I mean, I have to give the predictable answer, yes it is, because friction is the, is the enemy of sharing, and, and sharing is something that, a society, we've shown that we have an appetite to do. So it's, it's here, and yes, it's on an exponential growth, partly due to platforms like Facebook, which make it really easy to do this stuff. Um, but the, the issue I have with it is how much of the current sharing that we're observing is down to the willingness of the participants as opposed to the capabilities of the platforms. Um, when you can share what you're listening to on Spotify, yeah, it's dead easy. You press a button, away you go. You press once and you forget about it. But actually, is that sharing a conscious choice? Is that a desired choice? And is it adding any utility to me as the sharer, and more importantly, given we all know how the social web works, to the potentially thousands of people that are, are, are contacted by that, by that information. So I think frictionless sharing is here to stay. It has to be opt-in, we've learned that, and, and you know, Facebook gave us a good example of, of what happens when you, when you don't make it opt-in and, and you get a backlash. Um, so the, the, that's good. There has to be a value exchange in if, if sharing is to exist in permanence, because it's no, you know, so what? I'm listening to some Michael, Michael Bublé. That's a really bad example, shows how uncool I am. Um, but so what? Who cares? You know, maybe some Michael Bublé fans that I know me might care, but really, it's not that interesting. So it has to have some utility to the recipient. Um, and uh, we, need to, we need to think constantly about the value exchange as businesses when we're enabling this sort of sharing, because if it doesn't serve a purpose for somebody else, then you're just making noise. Do you think we're going to see more people opting out, a kind of big, large wave of people just saying no? Uh, we're seeing that with sharing generally, so we're seeing people getting tired of, once you get over the buzz of being able to tell the world what you've had for breakfast or where you're going or what you're wearing, you know, or even the most profound insights that you have in life, once you get over that buzz, then the, the, the drug it, it wears off very, very quickly. So we are going to see, I think, some resistance to this. Um, and I think the interesting bit in the, the stats there, there's lots of good stats, but 62%, I think it was, of people say that the idea of... of uh, no, 60% said they would share a brand's information on Facebook in return for a discount. And that, to me, I just... It horrifies me when I hear that because I know there is so many marketers who go rushing off saying, right, we've got to push discounts out, we've got to push discounts out. There's no value exchange, there's no long-term relationship that comes from that. So don't do it. You know, don't take these stats in the wrong context and go and do bad marketing. Use this to figure out how to do good marketing. Um, I think there are two types of frictionless sharing that we're talking about here. One is um, the frictionless sharing I've been uh, engaged in with Amazon for over 10 years. And it takes my data and it serves up recommendations and it knows my taste in literature and, and music better than my family does. That's fantastic. I'm approaching this from the perspective of the frictionless sharing which publishes stuff about what I'm doing to a network. And I think that's where there's a, there's a real problem. Um, I, agree, I agree that there's often a lack of value in what gets shared in that way. And if there's a lack of value in that, it's ultimately not going to take us very far. I've started reading this book called uh, Fast Brain, Slow Brain, and it's about you know, the two, the two parts of your brain, the, the bit that's instinctive and reactive, and it just does stuff without really thinking a lot. And the other bit, which is what arguably makes us intelligent, which is the bit that stops, thinks about what's being said, frames it, and presents it. And the problem with some friction sharing is it's, it's like turning off your rational part of your brain. It's just a flood of content. 
And I can't see that that's going to generate a lot of value. And I, I'm a, bit, a little bit older than the rest of the panel, and I spoke to my 20-year-old um, my daughter last night, uh, who I turned to for advice on sort of what, you know, what the, the zeitgeist is. And she's aghast by what's happening, because she doesn't like the idea of the embarrassing things she listens to, or the embarrassing news pages that she looks at being manifest to her network. And human beings do embarrassing things. And um, whatever happens with frictionless sharing, it's got to have an embarrassment button in there somewhere mm -hmm. so that you can retrieve the situation before it's too late. And Huffington Post does this quite well. I and mean, I didn't realize until a bit too late that my record of what I was reading on uh, Huffington Post was being served up to my network. But someone very kindly pointed out that the slightly racy content I was looking at was, was being surfaced and show me how to get rid of it. That should have been made much clearer right from the outset. So the design of the interfaces has got to recognize how embarrassing some of the things are that we do. Can I just say one, just one thing? I think, I think we need to be careful about when we talk about sharing, what, what we talk about. I mean, in the context of what we spoke about, the sharing in, in that immediate moment, right? That's, that's one part of sharing. The real value where it comes to is utility is if, if I've shared where I've been, or if I've shared my photo, if I've checked into a, to an event, or I've checked into a restaurant, and I've written a comment. Imagine my friends going to the that, that site, or the, wherever it is that, that has been registered, whether it's on um, I don't know, Yelp or whatever, because there's a Facebook integration. My friends can now go on to that six months later, see that I've gone to that restaurant, and see what I've said about that restaurant. So that may have been communicated on that day where I went to the restaurant. But the long-term value is when my friends go back onto a site, whether it's on Facebook or say Facebook with integration, and they've created something which was a share in that moment, that share becomes valuable because it helps them decide or filter or understand that their friends have been there and they, they had a, a rate or review on that. And again, you can apply that to, to everything, say TV or, or cinema. If I've shared the fact I've gone to see a film and in some way that film, I've been able to rate that uh, on a star as soon as I've watched it, Six months later, when I go onto a, a site which has got that Facebook integration that is pulling in those rating and reviews, that becomes valuable to my friends, right? So when we're talking about sharing, we shouldn't necessarily think about the thing that's happening in your newsfeed or your ticker now. It's what value can that deliver in the long term to help your friends or your, your, your social uh, graph understand a piece of content and give that social friend recommendation based on that activity that happened in that moment in time. Okay, some great points there about uh, frictionless sharing. But obviously there's an issue about whether it's too much, too useless, or just, you know, too awkward to share. Just to, it'd be interested to see from the audience, what do people think? Are you, do we want to see more? Are you in favour of frictionless sharing? So if you want to raise your hand, more frictionless sharing. Wow. Just five of you, four of you. Okay, there's looks like a bit of a battle there to be won on the friction sharing front. Uh, okay, Google Plus. Google Plus has come along. It's given us some new things in terms of social networking, the ability to group people into small kind of, you know, networks about things we're interested in, business, work, fun, sport, and that kind of thing. Uh, just again, for the audience, how many people actually signed up and you actively using Google Plus? Okay, at least more people would... That'll, you know, Google will be uh, pleased to see that more people are using it than uh, supporting friction and sharing. So, um, <laughs> um, so what, do, what, do, what do we think for the panel? You know, are, is that way of kind of organising our groups of friends and our, and our lives into kind of you know much tighter groups, much you know better better controlled groups that relate to kind of the things we do at work, at play, and other things? So again, let's start with Ash. Um. There's a thought that kind of relates to another question that you had about cons the consideration of convergence. Because um, I think people are becoming more time-starved and they're looking for more efficient ways to, to get on with their life and also efficient social lives as well. So, you know, uh, the opportunity to update everybody at the same time makes it a hell of a lot easier. Um, and at the same time, the, the opportunity to update a single profile, again, makes it that much more easier. However, um, for sure, uh, the context of grouping is becoming more and more necessary. And I think the older you get, your, um, your thinking of how you communicate with your network of 300 plus friends on Facebook, and in, in truth, there's probably only seven people that you communicate with, um, it'll start to become a reality as to 
um, why you have them there and what you actually share. Because in many cases, I'm sure that, um, what is it, the 293 people aren't seeing anything because they've been blocked out. Um, and that's because people have evolved. Times have changed. You want to um, be more personal about what you're saying. Um, and at the same time, I think for many people in this room, um, they use their Facebook for, for personal uh, use and also for work. And um, you know, the last thing you want to do is to share some project that you're working on that, that could be quite mind-numbing to, to the rest of your audiences. But you know, fr from an ease point of view, you, you just go through one, uh, one profile to do this. So um, I, I, I think obviously the, the facility needs to be made that much more easier. Um, I mean, I, I really struggle to, to understand, even on Facebook, how to do the, um, the, the filtering through. Um, but I, I think, going back to the issue of convergence for this, um, there are tools that sit outside that environment that can, um, can do that kind of grouping and filtering um, uh, independently. And, and I, I refer to, you know, with the new uh, Windows mobile, um, Windows phone technology, they, they, they cleverly craft um, grouping um, uh, within, within uh, the whole user experience and user journey. So contacts are grouped immediately. Uh, you look at your contacts and you can see what they're doing uh, and filter that through. So everything, uh, in terms of convergence, convergence for grouping is another consideration for um, how people, um, I guess, want to, uh, to share. Uh, it's probably a couple of things. One is, um, I mean, the average number of friends on Facebook is 150, 160, so we're not talking about hundreds and hundreds of people. Um, I think it's about choice, right? It would give people the, the choice to be able to construct these friend networks and then share with those friend networks. But essentially, people, people don't necessarily behave like that. It's, you give them the choice to do that, but they don't necessarily do it that way. I mean, the, the, the whole Google Plus circles thing is, 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 is interesting. It'd be really good to see how that, how that pans out and you keep a good, good eye on that. But um, I think within, within Facebook, we've, we've, we've definitely made a, a, a huge uh, investment and, and time to allow people to control and see who each of those updates uh, that are going to. I think it's more of a control thing rather than a, than a group thing. Um, because there are some things that, from an ego perspective, I want everyone to see, and there's some things from a personal perspective I only want particular people to see, particularly if it's really boring. I don't, I, I, I publish everything unless it's boring. If it's boring, I only publish it to certain people because I don't want people thinking I'm boring. But um, which I am. But um, so I think it's about control and it's about giving people the option to do that. But I think it's more than just putting people into groups. I think it's about how you can really. Um, set on each piece of content who that who that goes to, and I think that's a much more uh, much va more valuable piece of um, uh, functionality um, than constructing potentially friend groups, which you can also you can do in both Google Plus and in, and in Facebook. But um, I think I think it's this control of content who that goes to and understanding and understanding of that. Uh, I think the. The bit we're agreed on, on so far, and I'm going to agree again, that it has to be an opt-in, an optional choice, right? And it's a feature that, sh that, that it should be there. There are advanced users who will want to segment their audience and they will want to talk to certain people in different ways. So enabling that feature and making it easy to do, which no one really has done perfectly well because no one's completely happy with all the choices that we've got at the moment, um, that, that's, that makes sense. But the the problem with it is, as anybody who's tried to categorize their, their followers, is that relationship, human relationships are very fluid. They change. I might meet someone today and be my bestest buddy, but then by tomorrow they're just an acquaintance. Next week there's someone I sort of vaguely remember meeting. And we, relationships move and shift with time, and, but anything that requires manual intervention to categorize people is going to become quickly out of date. And there's no artificial intelligence that can work this stuff out for you. So then you've got this battle of between making it really, really easy for people to do, but also not making it mandatory that, so that people have to do it. And then quickly the utility of the service disappears. Um, the, the other thing that I think we have to keep in mind is that people, we were, we're talking about sharing in almost a uniform way, like everyone shares for the same motivations. They don't, and you've got to remember when you're doing uh, work as, as in, in business that the motivations of your users are very different to your own. Sometimes people are sharing 
because they're defining their personality. They're sharing a cool song because that's what makes shows who they are and what they stand for. Sometimes people are sharing very selectively with one-to-one -one and individuals. Sometimes people are just sharing because they, they want to communicate with, so they want to have some human contact with someone. And there's a whole, there's a whole range of different styles that people adopt. And so th this uniform sort of segmentation model, it really doesn't apply to the, the very nuanced way that we behave as human beings. And that's the issue with it. The number one thing, it has to be opt-in, has to be really easy, and it somehow needs more artificial intelligence that doesn't exist today that can actually manage that stuff in perpetually for you so that it remains relevant. Yes, there's, um, there's a trade-off here. I mean, I think as a society or as um, commercial organisations, you want more sharing, so you've got to make things simple to use. Make it simple, make it easy, people do more of it. But you then create a problem in that the quality of the content shared is arguably not very high, so you need to make it more sophisticated, and that's where something like Google Plus comes in, which is a more accurate model, I think, of how people really work, but it's just difficult to manage, and people seem disinclined to, to manage their circles at the moment. Um, my suspicion is that things will move towards the Google Plus model uh, eventually, as people adapt to this, this new environment. Um, I said earlier that I work behind the firewall at, uh, at Reuters, and, and, and Google Plus's model of separate, sometimes overlapping circles is, is how we think about the way our communities interact. Mm -hmm. These are financial market professionals who are worried about secrecy and um, uh, compliance laws and all that sort of stuff. They have to have very tight control over what they share with, with different groups. And I suspect in, in many other professional organizations that will be uh, the case. The problem, I think, is that ideally you just want one platform, so it's really, really simple and sophisticated but you don't want one platform because that would mean one organization dominating and that would be you know, too much control. So I, I don't see an easy, clean, elegant solution coming out of this, I'm afraid. That's it. Yeah, I, I certainly agree with the panel. There seems to be a maintenance issue that the time it takes to organize all these people is just most people actually can't be bothered. Uh, just looking at the audience, how many people actually currently kind of segment their friends and their interests across various social networks? It doesn't matter which. Wow, that's actually quite a lot of people. Okay, um, okay. Um, mobile sharing. Most of us increasingly share a lot of content or updates on our mobiles. How does the panel think that in the next five years that's going to change? What kind of new things are we going to see coming along in mobile sharing? Do you want to start? Yeah, should we start? Yeah, let's start this. Now. Okay. Um, well, I'm I'm curious about um, mobile banking and mobile financial transactions. So. Um, what happens when I use my mobile to pay for stuff, um, almost everything, and then the service provider I've got will know where I am, what I've bought, and a lot of other stuff from my social networks. And at that point, it'll be able to make some really intelligent recommendations to me, uh, like, you know, there are cheaper ways you could have bought that, or you buy a lot of this stuff here, why don't you try this other place? And I, th I think that the kind of friction of sharing that doesn't get made public, but is only used by your service provider to give you good recommendations. I think we're going to see a lot more of that, and I'm, I'm, I'm quite looking forward to that aspect of it. Um, I, th I think there's another aspect, which is, you know, I, when, I, when I travel or when I go and see friends, <coughs> I sort of want my mobile phone to be my media uh, aid, really. I want to be able to point it at the, my friend's TV set and it, for it to sort of recognize my content and recognize my subscriptions. So I can use it as a kind of, like a sort of media sonic screwdriver. It kind of adapts to the device I'm pointing at. Kind of at. social passport on the booth. Yeah, that, that, I think, I, I'm, I'm thinking there's going to be a lot more of that, and I'm, I'm looking forward to that one as well. Uh, I'm not going to argue that mobile is going to not explode as it already is. Uh, mobile sharing, I don't think everything will be mobile. We won't even use that term fairly soon. Um, and what I think it needs to become is a much less disruptive thing. I don't know, how many Foursquare users have we got in the room? Probably quite a few. There you go. So quite a few people check into places. I grew so tired and a little bit of me died every time I checked into the Foursquare after a while because I just thought, what's the point? Why am I doing this? Now, I admit, if you're in New York or a big city in the States, perhaps, you might find you get offers and it actually sort of, there's, there's a value exchange there, right? But I was just checking in and, and actually, when I walk into a venue, I don't want to sit and have to 
fiddle around my phone to tell people where I am. You know, I want to get on with doing what I'm doing. And so it, for, for sharing in a mobile, dev mobile device, and particularly location-based stuff, it has to be a lot less disruptive to your life. And it also has to be a lot more controllable for the individual because there are some places like here where, yes, I don't mind checking in. There are other places I'm not going to mention that I might not want other people to know about. And so it's, it needs to be something that I control at a very granular level but also just to happen in the background without me having to think about it. Um, I, I look forward to the time when we have that level of control because actually there are times when it'd be really useful to have frictionless checking in, for example, on a mobile device. You know, when I walk into the office at Microsoft Campus, it would be quite useful for those members of my team who, who, who want to get in touch with me to see that I've entered the building, right? It would be quite, you know, my mum would quite like the fact in the future to know that I've got clean pants and a vest on or whatever you know and, and maybe the technology will come that will allow that information just to be shared to say yeah I'm all right I've arrived you know when how many of us still do that two rings thing when we when we go home we go away and we ring our parents up and just give us two rings so let us know that you're home well actually mum your mum I you can know when I get home but my phone will tell you it doesn't do that, and that's where I think we're heading towards, is that type of more granular level where... So uh, smart, smarter frictionless sharing that involves... Much smarter, much more controllable, and it's opt-in for the user, so that actually adds some value to my life and means I don't have to phone my mum to say, yeah, I've got home safely. Trevor. Got it. Um, if you look at, uh, in terms of mobile development, um, it's where all the interesting stuff's happening now, right? It's, we are going to be a mobile company very, very soon. If you look at our stats, Nearly half of our users are, are, are use it on mobile. Um, mobile users uh, share more, uh, and they use it more. Right? They, they share double, 2.5 times more uh, content, and content is as yet to be defined. It could be status updates, photos, check-ins, all of those things that you see in your newsfeed. That happens 2.5 times more on mobile than it does on um, on the desktop, and that's only going to going to continue to increase. If you think about all the applications that are now being um, launched, so when we launched our, our new Open Graph a few weeks back, and we launched those 60 applications, uh, many of those were were mobile only. So things things like um, food spotting. Um, even pin interest is a pretty interesting uh, mobile application, although it's also online. Uh, it's only going to keep continuing, and, and the development is just, is just exceptional. Um, so mobile is going to be the primary way that people access the internet if it isn't already. It's where people are already sharing more things than they are and on, on desktop, and they're going to increase that. Um, the nature of the phones and the s smartphones and even feature phones. So if you think about feature phones are what the majority of phones that are in the world, particularly in emerging markets. But even now, we're starting to build platforms within the feature phones that they can actually do things and share things on those pretty basic platforms. So that's going to explode in, in developing markets and, and, and in here. So when we talk about mobile sharing, it's, it's a given that it's going to explode and probably far out, out outweigh the sharing that happens on traditional traditional desktop. Um, and there's going to be really great development of platforms and, and applications. And, and again, it just comes down to, to control, right? Because w when you start to think of your mobile as your... I mean, one of the, I didn't used to go to Starbucks. I maybe went to Starbucks once a month. I've been going every single day for the last three weeks since they launched their new app where I can now pay for it using my scanner. Not because I want a coffee, but because I want to show off to the people in the line that I'm playing using my coffee, right? But that's um, paying using my phone. That's an expensive way of showing off. Yeah, I know, but um, it's... Yeah, I... I, I it's fine. I like showing off. Um, the uh, but that's that's just the start of what 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 could happen in terms of, of that. Um, so yeah, we were at a really interesting point, and and mobile is going to accelerate, and we've already in terms of sharing, and we've already seen that now. So I echo everything you just said there. It's um, it's quite obviously comforting to know that mobile's got a, a great future. Um, but from my po from my point of view, how I see uh, the mobile playing a part, I mean, the phone is probably the most personal device that anybody has and will have moving forward. And um, what's great is the type of um, sharing that can occur and will occur uh, through the mobile device. Uh, there's added contextual layers that you don't currently have, um, obviously via conventional PC or Mac. Um, so, you know, uh, f certain uh, technologies like the accelerometer or a gyroscopic movement or NFC or sensory um, 
uh, capabilities of the phone, that's going to add a new dimension to the type of post that you, uh, uh, you, you start to talk about. You know, um, it, it may automatically pick up, you know, other sensors that you wouldn't, you know, what the atmosphere's like in, in a specific place, in a location. Obviously, you've got ge geolocation, and, and this is becoming more and more apparent in, in the kind of applications that get um, uh, made available on the phone, that every time it's asking you to just to confirm that you want to uh, share where your location is. And, you know, just taking your, your earlier point, that may not be uh, relevant for now, but at a later date, if you're using a certain app, it starts to recognize and pick up the trend of movement that you have, and it, it, you'll find that it actually uh, aids you in a, in a situation for, you know, if it's a, um, a navigational issue or, um, you know, uh, a preference to, uh, to, to visit, that information is already stored and it's proactively serving you. So that's interesting. Um, but, you know, the fact that um, the, the phone allows uh, context to be applied, this is going to also assist information sharing for, for example, I think Waves uh, measures the movement of, um, uh, if you participate in it, it measures your movement um, and that then gets uh, integrated into um, a traffic um, uh, a, tra a traffic solution that tr truly identifies uh, how much movement is occurring in a certain situation. So, you know, these kind of things will feed through, um, and I think a whole new level of of sharing will then be um, established. We're saying phone and mobiles, but obviously, you know, we've got one. You know, we've got one tablet on the panel here. Tablet devices are obviously going to become, you know, yeah. almost universal among you know that group of people as well. Does the panel think that? Mobile plus tablet equals anything else. I mean, it will bring something else to it. I'm speaking as Trevor Johnson here, not as Facebook. So my comments are from Trevor. Um, tablets. I'm not sure they're mobile devices. I mean, a mobile device is something you have with you all the time. I know there'll be some people who have a tablet with them all the time, but the um, majority of people that have a, uh, a tablet have it at home, right? They have it... At, on their desktop. How many uh, sorry, people in the audience desktop. have got tablet devices with them today? But with, we're in a digital event in London, right? <laughs> we're, not, we're not representative of, of everyone. My mum, for instance, I always use my mum as a really great benchmark. If my mum's doing something, I'm going to invest in that thing and I'm going to take that thing seriously because if she's doing it and it's on her radar, then it's, everyone is. She <laughs> used... <laughs> <laughs> she... Um, her uh, her uh, iPad is for the bedroom, but she wouldn't even take it into the lounge, right? It's the bedroom. <laughs> my my girlfriend, it's like she wouldn't she wouldn't take the iPad out out the door because she's worried that there's nowhere to put it, right? She, where would I where would I carry it? It's like her bag's too small, or it will get bunched up or whatever. So, at this moment in time, my Trevor Johnson's opinion is that the 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 tablet although you can carry it around, isn't a mobile, in, in the purest sense, mobile device. I think there's that distinction between a portable device, which a tablet obviously is, and a mobile device. And, and that's, I think, the nuance that you're drawing out, which is, yeah, the, the, the true mobile device is a thing that you would not leave the house without at any time. And that is our, that is our smartphone, our mobile phone. Um, and, uh, yeah, thanks for the reminder that, th that we are not our customers this is not representative in any way of the real world. So keep it in mind that you know the majority of people do not have a tablet. Majority of people do not carry uh, smartphones and drive around in minis and do all the stuff that we do here in London. It's a very, very different world out there. Okay, but Trevor, I think you should get your girlfriend a bigger handbag just in case. Um, <laughs> um, we've already kind of touched on this, but looking forward in fi five years, the kind of sharing that uh, users will be doing then. Are there? Is there something that the panel thinks, it's, you know, further down the line, we're going to start sharing new ways of sharing anything we've touched on so much already that we're going to start seeing. Ash, Trevor, you got the mic, Trevor. Go <laughs> uh, I just think it's a continuation on the, on the theme. I think it's um, how can we make, uh, come back to, to your point earlier, how can we make sharing a utility? The, the example, the amazing example we give is um, from TV. So you sit down, you've got 45 minutes, you sit down, you want to watch TV. You switch on Sky and you're flicking through the 600 channels. Um, and then by the time you've got to the channel 600, the 45 minutes is gone and you have to go. Imagine being able to switch onto the TV and log in using your social account 
and you've seen what your friends have watched because they've, they've shared that with you. You've seen what they've recorded and you have access to their box because they've allowed you to that and they shared that with you. Um, uh, and you can see what they're watching now. So you can see if there's 14 of your friends watching a particular program that helps you make that decision. That's when sharing becomes a utility and that's where it becomes really, really uh, important. It's how can you uh, make sharing into utility and apply it to a, uh, a system, a media, a platform in a really relevant, engaging way. And I think you can think about any digital medium where you can, you can, you can apply that to. We've seen it already with music. We're going to see it with TV. Um, we're probably going to see it with shopping and, and e-commerce and anything else going forwards. That's, that's where it's going to go, where it becomes just expected that you're going to be able to filter all of this information that you can, that you can access just by your friends. That's, that's where the goal, of, I think, of sharing is, and that's where it becomes an amazing thing. Makes me wonder how we managed before all this technology came along. How did we survive this long as a human race without sharing our every movement and our every detail and everything else? So, okay, let's let's do a reality check here. I think there is, um, yes, that we will share more content. Technology will be will shrink ever further. Um, I think the era of more narrow cast sharing is perhaps a in more interesting area for us to think about. So there are things like my medical records or my heart rate right now or my stress levels or my I don't know some cholesterol levels that, that actually technology could be transmitting to my doctor in real time uh, if I need to if I have a condition and that, that would be very very selective that's one-to-one -one, um, information sharing and um, we're already seeing insurance companies are giving reduced premiums to drivers who take a piece of technology into their car to show that they're driving responsibly um, that again, that brings value to both the insurance company, brings down the, the uh, claims, and to the user, brings down the premiums. And that makes complete sense. That's another form of sharing that we will become much more, much, much more comfortable with. I was kind of reminded of um, the, when, when, do you remember when Caller ID first appeared on uh, the old telephone things? And that was, there was, there was uproar. Um, and this is not that long ago, I don't know when, when it was, but people were really shocked that, hang on, so if, if I ring someone, they can see who I am, what my phone number is. And now it's just the norm, we don't even think about it. So there are things, I agree with Trevor, that we will just get used to, we'll just expect, that's, just, that's public knowledge or that's public data, or that's data that I share on a one-to-one -one basis. But there are also a huge number of things that we could share that technology might encourage us to share, but adds absolutely no value to anyone whatsoever. So. Um, we've managed this far as a human race to survive and evolve as we are, so I'm not sure we need as much sharing as perhaps some people would have you believe. Uh, I think we're just scratching the surface in terms of sharing. We've picked up the low-hanging fruits, and if you think about most of, most of the sharing that happens, it's about pe what people like or what they dislike. Um, and that's useful, very useful, and, and companies are able to turn that to their advantage and predict trends and... Uh, make sure that the, the shop shelves are full of the right stuff. But what about all that other stuff that human beings know that's sort of locked away in their brains, their kind of expertise in their particular you know, hobby or their um, area of, of specialist interest that, that's not really being mobilized at the moment? And I, I'm not quite sure what the, the term for it is, but these are, these are much smaller communities. They're definitely communities of interest. And I think if you get the technology right, but also the kind of behaviours, the kind of the way that people treat one another, there's an enormous amount of knowledge to be unlocked. And I, I think that's, that's where the most interesting areas are going to be in the future. I mean, I, I speak as someone who's worked with some of the busiest professionals on the face of the earth, sort of traders and investors in, in financial markets. I was told that they were too busy, too worried about uh, litigation, um, arguably too tied up in themselves to, to share, to share what they knew. But, but they, they are, they're prepared to share. If you create the right environment, and I think mobile advances, advances in tools, advances in the controls of tools, are gonna to unlock an enormous amount of this intelligence, which will be both commercially valuable, but incredibly valuable also to the individuals, because they'll, it'll allow them to share what they know. And I think that is gonna be a much more satisfying space to be in than simply streaming what your, um, your music playlist is. 
Okay. Uh, we do have another question here, which I'm just going to skip over. It's about the ubiquity, ubiqu the ubiquity of sharing and whether that could uh, hurt or benefit businesses. And I think we've already kind of touched on that. So I'm going to put one last question to the panel, then open it up to the floor. So, okay, this is a sort of fun one. Uh, the most bizarre or embarrassing thing you have ever shared. And I will go first, because I recently shared unfortunately, on Facebook, a picture of my, a fr myself and a friend. And the friend had uh, dreadlocks. It was from a demonstration years ago. He's now head of comms, went to a meeting the next day and was greeted by howls of laughter as everyone had seen pictures of him with his dreadlocks and he was livid. Um, Ash. Um, it's not so much the most bizarre, but it's intriguing. Um, I don't, has anybody seen the, the viral clip of uh, Scarlet Takes a Tumble? Um, it's a really strange um, clip, but it's not so much that that I was sharing. I was, uh, I was sharing the response of people's, so people's reactions to a viral, which became a sub-viral in itself. And um, I, I just found it fascinating how, um, how basically this became a new phenomenon of viral within viral. So, I mean, that I thought was, it was a hilarious clip, but just to, just to follow that was, I think it was quite bizarre. The, the only one I can think of is an embarrassing one. So I was on the, actually it was with you guys. I was, with, <laughs> I was on a panel with uh, Chris Maples, who's the uh, commercial director of Spotify, who I'm also friends with on Facebook. Um, and just before I, we got on the panel, he said, interesting song choice there. And I didn't know what he was talking about. And apparently my, Spotify had gone on to Dolly Parton 9 to 5 just before um, we met and it obviously got communicated to everyone including Chris so he took great delight in using that as an example within the panel and it's quite embarrassing. That's a good tune but I like it's Michael Bublé. It's, a, it's so a great tune. Can we, um, I think for me, uh, as anyone who knows me, I spent 10 years with a company called Kimberly Clark where I used to do marketing for brands like Kleenex and Huggies, Kotex and Andrex and um, so I got quite used to talking about orifices and all sorts of things that normal people don't talk about. And I, I, it's just the way I am. And I just, I just, you know, I spent that many years in focus groups listening to people telling me how they, what they did with toilet paper that I just get used to it. And so I'm quite routinely sharing pictures of interesting urinals that I spot. Or um, I, I was for a brief time the mayor on, on Foursquare uh, of building two, floor two, stall two, gents' toilets. Um, <laughs> which I thought took great pleasure in stealing the mayorship from somebody else until I realised that they actually didn't want it back and then I was stuck with the chains of office forevermore and then I discovered the feature where you can renounce your mayorship. So, yeah, there's all sorts of... It's normally toilet related with me, I'm afraid. In, uh, back in 1976, I fell in love with punk rock, um, but bizarrely, I also developed a, a taste for Hawkwind, sort of strange sci-fi metal band. I kept this guilty secret safe for over 30 years. Then Spotify came along, and uh, it's now out there in the open. You've set Hawkwind free. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, uh, questions from the audience. Who's got a question they would like to put? Guy in the red jumper at the back there, with hand up. I don't think that's working. Oh, there we go. Um, and the survey itself said that 60% of people would be willing to share content in return for some form of point or reward. Now, my understanding is, on Facebook particularly, they're very much against that. You know, incentives for sharing, because as I think one of the panelists mentioned, the potential for filling your feed full of stuff, so, you know, I've got 10% here. I'm only sharing this for something I've been given. I just wanted to get the view either of Trevor as Trevor or as Facebook on that sort of development. I don't think we're, we're against incentivising um, behaviour, uh, sorry, incentivising actions per se, but there's, there's two things. One is that you, you can't explicitly incentivise someone to do something that is completely alien to what they would have done before. That's just not authentic natural behaviour. So you just need to be careful on that. And two, we always say to brands that if you are going to, say, acquire fans based on a, uh, an incentive or based on a competition, you need to understand that they may not necessarily be the people that are, you want as a long-term um, 
uh, base of people to communicate. So you just need to be careful about how you do that and in what way you do that. Um, so incentives per se aren't, aren't bad. You just have to be really clever about how you do them and, and what you're incentivizing and don't incentivize behavior that isn't necessarily authentic and, and, and reliable. Gaming mechanics are a great way for um, new products, new systems, new things, functionalities to get to a point where they get mass awareness. However, it's not a mainstream thing. The game, your gaming mechanic after a while um, uh, isn't the way to maintain and, and continue to grow. You need to have something, something, something different, something else, um, unless it's like loyalty points or loyalty schemes. But again, they need to be done in the context of other activity that you're doing to ensure that you're, you're, you're getting both the right people and incentivizing them in the right way. Can I, can I just add to that? Um, because, yeah, um, gamification of, um, I guess, loyalty programs um, uh, done in the right way um, obviously uh, does have benefit for, let's say, community spirit. But um, there are cer certain brands and um, companies or services out there that fall foul of that where, you know, um, and we, we look very carefully into the whole ap application of gamification to a, a to uh, an advocate program. And, uh, and the whole point of uh, uh, the screening that we did, uh, weeded out the kind of competition hunters. Uh, there's a certain DNA in all of the people that become a member of the advocacy program that we have through the, the, the rigor and testing and, and, and how they're associated in their kind of archetype. But there are brands out there that um, effectively um, ask you to um, do certain things, earn points, but effectively start to talk positively about the brand without you actually even having an experience of the brand, which is a fundamental issue that we have to be all very mindful and careful on. The difference here on, on our program is it's everything that we do is related to brand and product experience. A really, a really great example, actually, is um, there's American Express are doing a uh, campaign product, whatever, called Link Like Love where you go on to the application, you allow the application to know who you are in terms of Facebook and your likes and interests. It allows you to link your, your Amex uh, account to that application. Then it can start to serve you daily deals and incentives based on what it knows you like and then and give you uh, points when you actually redeem them at, at, the, at the till. Um, that's a very powerful thing, right? Because it's, it's American Express able to deliver value to their users based on the Facebook information, what they know, and it allows the user to get um, deals and uh, rewards for uh, activating or, or using the things that they've been sent that is based on who they are. So as a game in, gamification or gaming mechanic at its core, that's a very powerful and starting to be a very significant thing for Amex. Mark or Alistair, do you want to add to that anything? I'd just re I'd echo the points about the um, the value of of the, the of the behaviour that you're trying to get from people. So I see it's, marketers are inherently lazy, and uh, myself included. And we'll we'll always try. You know, if we can get a thousand people to do something through the easiest possible way, we will. And that doesn't necessarily always bear in mind the long term consequences of that. And uh, unless you're prepared to do something with that community to have continual value that you can bring to their lives that is at least comparable to the f initial incentive that you used to hook them in the first place, just don't do it because it's not, it's not there for the long term. And um, you might hit your metric for this month or whatever it is you're chasing, but that's not what brands are about long term. Brands are built on the long term, so, so build for the future. Yeah, some smart advice there on the kind of short termism and pitfalls that brands can fall into in social networks. Okay, uh, any more questions? Questions? Sorry about that. Thank you all for uh, coming out today and speaking with us, first of all. Um, my question is, where, where do you see sharing going in the future to the point that, because I'm, I'm already thinking that we're getting borderline on um, issues of privacy um, violations. I mean, obviously there's, if, sorry, but Facebook has a history of, of, of uh, privacy um, violations in the past. Um, they're not the only um, ones, but at some point we're going to get to this apex where 
we're sharing too much and it's not necessarily that we are conscious that we're sharing necessarily everything we are because I think there's a lot of people out there that aren't conscious that they're sharing what they're sharing and there's a breach of privacy there so where do we cross the line where do we draw the line with uh, with sharing uh, Trevor that seems to be one for you to start with uh, so privacy is, is control right it's about understanding what what they're creating and who that goes to and I think we, we made uh, significant strides in doing that the um Every time the new media comes along, there's always a question about privacy, right? So um, printing press, for instance, going back to whenever it was, there was privacy concerns there that someone could write a letter that can be replicated and be sent elsewhere. When the telephone was, was, um, uh, uh, was invented, people thought that the thing would sit in the room and listen to everything you said and would communicate that to all of your friends. Um, when the internet full stop was created, all of a sudden you had a, a global... Um, audience that you could put something up and, and the control was now no longer within the system or the media, it was with, with, the, with the users. We're now seeing the same sort of discussions when it comes to social. So there needs to be a period of where people understand and p begin to accept and understand how they can control what they're sharing to who and, and when. And that's the discussions we're having, we're having now, right? And I, I, I think we're doing a much better job uh, of, of trying to uh, lead, lead people through that. I think us as an industry are doing much better jobs now. Um, we're now, in terms of the open graph platform, some of the things you talked about was control when you go onto a site and it knows who you are and it asks you if you want to share something. Maybe in the early days people would just automatically share that because we were desperate to get people to use the thing and, and, and get people to understand that. But and I think we can now take, take a step back and say, look, we don't have to share everything in order to be successful as a business. We can give people the control and it still means our business is successful. And I think that's it's just a continuation of, of, of that. So yeah, the privacy things are, the discussion is, is, is an important one. Um, but I think the industry, us as an industry are doing some really good things to help consumers through that and prove the value of, of what that actually means going forwards. And in 20 years time, there'll be something different. There'll be a, no, a new thing, a new media that will, will have exactly the same conversations. Uh, I'd like to come in on the on the privacy thing. I think, um, Trevor, you said privacy is, is about control. It is, but it also should be about transparency. And that's the bit that we haven't got a good handle on at the moment. How do I find out everything that the internet knows about me? I can't. It, it's, it's really, really hard today. And that's the point that we need to be at if people are genuinely to accept that my controls are as I want them to be. Because invariably, when you talk to people, where you've got frictionless sharing going on, there's a horror story. And, and this is amongst the early adopters, the people in this room, you know, this type of community, of, oh, I didn't know that was happening. I had no idea. And that's a relatively sophisticated user. So the only way you get to mass consumption and adoption and happiness with these tools is if the transparency is also there. So you can have an instant audit, an instant control over what you have and haven't seen. And I think the risk is that if, as an industry, as, as platform providers, we don't make that really a good service to, to communities, then the legislators will come in and government will come in and say, actually, this is a problem, our citizens aren't happy about this and we're gonna bring in legislation, like you know the e-privacy directive, which is really a jackhammer to crack a nut, and the, this is the cookies directive, uh, if you're not familiar with it, that you know, really is trying to lock down stuff in a very prohibitive way that will actually potentially do a lot of harm to business as well as good to citizens. So we don't really want that. So it's our job to make it as transparent as possible so that there isn't need for the legislators to step in and overrule us. It seems to be a feeling that, you know, you know, making allies private is, is, isn't as easy as it should be, that the transparency issue, that the industry doesn't make it easy to keep things private. Is that, Mark, what do you think? Um, well, I'm not sure whose responsibility it is, to be perfectly honest. Um, it seems to me that what's happened is that there's been a revolution, and um, it's around social media, and social media literacy for a large number of groups has lagged behind the potential use of the tools. Now, you know, you could argue that <coughs> the providers of the utilities like Facebook ought to do more, um, or you might say that actually it's a role of the state, uh, the education system, to do more. I mean, I, I don't see any public service uh, announcements or advertisements or any campaigns around this. And I'm a bit surprised by that because it's obviously an incredibly difficult but potentially productive area. And we sort of need to get it right. So, I mean, I don't know. I mean, have you been involved with any educational programs, Trevor? Not yet, but there is a... Um 
I mean, we understand that technology moves quickly, but human behavior moves very slowly. And I think that's what you're, what you're talking about there, that, that technology maybe has, has, is moving a lot faster than, than humans do or can. Um, so it's a, it's a good point. There is, the, the, there is a challenge, whether that's us or whether it's an industry, where um, uh, there has to be an element of education. But we've got, we've got people now who are growing up with it in, as, as currency, right? They know it's, it's, their, it's what they do. So there's a whole wave of, of a generation. I'm unfortunately at 34. I'm, I'm now uh, old when it comes to being at Facebook. I sit in uh, meetings with the 25-year-olds and they're talking about things I've never heard of and they have a perception of life and the internet that I didn't grow up with, right? But so those people understand that. So I think it's people like myself and and maybe us on the panel that are the ones that need that educating rather than the, the new wave. Should we do any more questions? Any more questions for the panel? Um, there's a hand raised right at the back there on the, um, my left. Hi, and thanks for coming. So my question is related to the quality of content that is shared and the platform where it is shared. I'm thinking of uh, different communities that uh, are living uh, and existing outside the umbrella of Facebook, like the growing community of uh, Instagram, for example, or even Pinterest now. So what do you think in the future will be the role of these communities that don't want to probably be represented by Facebook? So the quality of the content that's coming out So Just on those things, the, um, it's really important to understand that Facebook isn't Facebook.com. Facebook is a platform where you can use your ID and your, your, your likes and interests and your friends to uh, unlock something. So Instagram, Pin Interests, Food Spotter, Food Spotting, uh, uh, Spotify, all of these things are separate standalone things that have a Facebook integration of them. So as their platforms, they, their social is contained within their own platforms themselves, which is unlocked by a Facebook login. So I think that sort of, that sort of answers your question, is that, is that right? Uh, yes or no, because I'm always thinking about the difference between uh, YouTube and Vimeo, for example. Right. So, so on that, I can't answer that, but um, on, the, on, the social, on the social bit, it's I suppose the point I'm making is when you think about, so when you think about Facebook, don't think about Facebook.com. Don't think about the things that exist within Facebook because it's much, it's much more than that. There are three million sites that have Facebook integration. There are hundreds of thousands of apps that have Facebook integration. All of those are standalone businesses that integrate a, the, the, the platform of Facebook to make their, their platforms much more social. Um, uh, yeah, I think that's, that's the point. Uh, the, the other thing that we have to... Uh, Facebook is huge, it's the biggest network, therefore it gets the, the most attention. Yes, it is. It's with the open graph. It's an, the, you can face, people can do Facebook things outside of Facebook, of course. But what's also important is people are exhibiting Facebook-like behaviours in a number of in all kinds of different places. So th this sharing thing, it doesn't have to exist just on the big networks. It could be, could be on your support forum. It could be in a really dark corner of the web that's very, very specialist and very niche communities. And often they're the best places for people to be because that's where they find the most like-minded people. So the, the sharing can happen anywhere. Don't narrow, don't, don't put the blinkers on, just think about the big networks. Um, think about how, they, how you can get, maybe, maybe I'll describe it as Facebook-like behaviors where you want it to take place. Yeah, and I think I've also seen those stickers you can buy Facebook like stickers and stick them on things in the real world. So if you want your own bag of stickers. Can I, can I, just, <coughs> can I just say that uh, as, as, um, as people get more and more used to these kind of Facebook style or Twitter style behaviors, they're beginning to expect it in all their online experiences. So um, they're looking to all uh, providers of, of online stuff to be able to uh, mobilize their, their, their likes or their dislikes or answer their questions or those sorts of things. So. Whatever else happens, I think um, sharing is going to stay with us, whether it's predominantly on Facebook or the brand new Facebooks that we haven't dreamt of yet. It seems to me that that, that is now an accepted behaviour which will only expand. Okay, we're just going to take... Did you have something you wanted to add to that, Ash? Just, just one, I think, final point from my point of view is I think convergence technologies <coughs> are potentially where conversations can be taken out of um, Facebook or LinkedIn or Twitter um, and ultimately, these could be the, uh, the, uh, the, the playground areas for people to then migrate to. My, my, there's two points. Um, issues of uh, privacy 
uh, I think could potentially come to a head, which could potentially affect all of these kind of conversion technologies and all of the sharing capabilities that we've been talking about. Um, it only takes a couple of human stories to, to surface for then, I guess, governments to intervene and identify that sharing has gone too far and uh, data, uh, there needs to be some kind of control and, and regulation. Right now, I think um, <laughs> um, it's impossible to, to slow or stop um, what's happened with, um, with community sharing. I don't think any government would be, would be brave enough to make that kind of statement now. So therefore, uh, we, we all have to be very mindful uh, of there is going to be a moment in time where we have to consider an alternative to uh, where the, 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 the social technology is going. Okay, we've got time for one last question. Is there okay. a hand? Hi, um, um, my name is Farhan Rahman. I'm from Conscious Comms. Um, I've, I've got a question for you guys. You're talking about sharing within your existing communities, within friends networks that you already know that are already established. And I don't know about everybody else, but for me, you know, I find it much more interesting when it's something new that's outside of my sphere of awareness. And most of the time that's coming from people or places or information or things that are not already aware of within my current environment. So as, as an example in point, Amazon is great for surfacing similar things that I like, but there's nothing better than going to a bookstore and just browsing a section. You can't do that in Amazon in the same way. And whilst it's great that I can get a personalized experience from all the people that I already know, they're not the ones that I'm interested in knowing more about. Whilst they have similar interests, I have interests that aren't necessarily the same as theirs, and I want to be able to see that stuff, but I want to be able to see that stuff in a meaningful way that's filtered or curated in some context, but they're not necessarily people that I know of, they're not necessarily people that I have any relationship with, other than it's an interest of mine. How are you guys looking at that or addressing that? Because right now, everything I've heard is all about people you already know, networks you've already got, and it's blocking you from being able to discover stuff that's not already there. Welcome to Pinterest. Basically, that, I think, deals with your... Um... But, but, but even with Pinterest, you're looking at people that are curating similar types of visuals, so there's already a, a, a predisposed they're not, they're not people you know, though. No, no, they're not people you know, but, you know, same with Twitter. Before it started, we, like, the promise of the internet was you would find people with similar interests that you didn't necessarily know in person. And so you were able to create these relationships. There were fewer people, there was less noise, it was quicker, it was more transparent and more meaningful. Now that all of our friends and family are on there, suddenly that ability to discover those interesting conversations and to have that meaningful interaction, it disappears in the noise of all the sharing and liking and you know the, the commenting and the brand stuff. And whilst it's great for brands wanting to be a part of that, as a user, you know, my experience when there was just IRC is very different to now, you know, there's Facebook, Twitter, and Google Plus where I can have conversations with all of these contexts, but I'm not getting the same quality of interaction. Um, there are, let's look at this a very high, a macro, a very high level. There are two major competing forces here. Brands love communities, close communities, because if I've got a community, I can push my stuff and then they don't get to hear about anything else and I think I'm living in this perfect world and they'll buy all my stuff forevermore and we'll be rich and happy. People love serendipity. We thrive as a human species on the unexpected, on the unusual things, on being stretched, on being pushed out of our comfort zone, on doing different things. And so we love to have new interactions, which is what you're talking about. And th th I think there is a, there's an opportunity for brands, and I think Pinterest is a very interesting experiment. I'm not sure that's the end solution. I'm sure that type of capability will be replicated very quickly by some of the big networks. Um, uh, but, it's, but it's very, very interesting to do. So as brands, if you can introduce some serendipity, if you can actually show that there is authenticity in what you're doing and it's not just this closed community, then there is more trust that will come with that and you'll actually be giving people what they want. So I think you're touching on a really important insight into human behavior. The opportunity for marketeers now is to say, well, how do I inject that into my marketing campaign and move beyond the closed, locked-in community that I've always wanted to create? It sounds like you're almost uh, calling for someone to set up a new social network which throws together random groups of people and ran with random interests. Well, no, no, no. It's, it's not even about the randomness. It's about the way in which my experience on a platform is being filtered for me or curated for me. The moment I show 
some of my preferential information and my network and my relationships from one platform to another. So if I go from any platform, right, and I say I've got friends on X platform, it shows me all of them. I don't want to have all of them on every platform, but I'll choose which ones I want. But as I start doing that, it's only to start the conversation because you've got a few people that you have similar interests with. You're choosing those people because you've got a common interest, but you want to find more people that are more deeply interested in those similar things. When you go into a network where all of your friends are there, if it's about just your personal experience, right? As an individual, you'll only ever grow to the extent of your environment. But if you can remove the people that you know, but actually find just a few of them, and be able to separate out you know, everybody from just the few people that have that similar interest. You know, if you're on Pinterest and you've got other friends that are into baking, and you're all sharing baking stuff, you'll find more people that are into baking. But if you're then going on there and looking for you know, people that are into DIY, you'll find those people by the content, but not by the relationship, oh, you know, that's my uncle that already does DIY. But doesn't Twitter lists do that? It does not deliver on what you're explaining there. How many people in this room use Twitter lists? Right? It's not representative. It's not representative. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can, I, can I? How many people want to do what you're, what you're describing there? Well, no, it's, I, I'm not, it's not a judgment. It's a yeah, yeah, No, it's no, a no, no, no. And, and for me, that's the, that's the fundamental question. How many people enjoy the serendipitous moment that you described? Like that moment of discovery, that moment of that joy of finding something that nobody you know knows about, something that's new to you, that, that experience of something new, something that's different. And you know, brands and marketeers are trying to embrace that, but you know, what they're looking for is content that again is pushed out through their networks. I suffer, I suffer from the opposite problem to you. So I'm endlessly distracted by serendipity on the web. And so are most of my, my workmates. And, um, you know, I, I mean, I, I know what you're saying, and I can see the risks of having homogeneity. And I, you know, one of the things that I do is make sure I introduce different voices to communities that could have very similar people in them. But, but the web itself seems to solve the problem, I'd have thought. I mean, in particular, Twitter for me. Yeah, Twitter is very good. You might follow a lot of people who are interested in digital media, but they've got lots of other interests which they also share with you at the same time. I think YouTube do that, do that well as well. I mean, how many people get lost in looking at a video and then an hour later you've realised you've watched about 20, 30 different videos and you've, you're completely embedded in, into Twitter? I think, that, I think there are elements of what you're, you're, you're describing there uh, which people are already building into their platforms, into their systems. And I think if it's already there, it's probably going to increase going forwards, right? Yeah, no, just my I think um, we've actually got, I've been given the wrap-up signal, actually. Really interesting debate. So maybe there's a new social network out there and someone has the idea for it. But thanks to the panel and thanks for everyone for the questions and for everyone coming along today.